Today's video is going to be a conversation on whether it's better to use a bunch of dedicated devices, each completing their task perfectly, or one impressively consolidated device that can accomplish all those same tasks, but with some minor limitations. And our guinea pig for this topic is the Zoom F6. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and I'm the very model of a modern major general. So normally I'd hold the device that I'm talking about so I can point at things, but that's not going to work today because I'm recording this audio on the Zoom F6 right now, both internally on its SD card, but also via USB to Adobe Audition so that I have a redundant recording and so that I can compare the differences between the internal 32-bit float recording and the 24-bit that's sent to my DAW. And I'm also going to use the F6 as my audio interface for editing this video and mixing the audio both with my headphones and with my studio monitors. And I've already done this process a couple times to feel confident enough to make this video, but if for some reason I run into any issues, I'm sure Editor Gerald from the future would chime in right about now to tell us if there were any unforeseen problems. So given that I'm still talking to you now, I'm guessing everything went smoothly. Now normally for this process I would use a combination of devices. If I was recording at my desk, I would do all the interfacing and audition stuff with my Steinberg UR22 Mark II, which for the most part is a pretty darn good interface for the money. I have experienced two issues with it however. One, the headphone volume isn't the greatest and it does struggle to drive my DT770s. And two, I've been experiencing audio drift in my recordings. Some of you might remember me talking about this in previous videos where I always had to rate stretch my recordings by the smallest percent to get it to line up with my in-camera scratch audio. I tried everything to fix this, different software, different drivers, ensuring the sample rates and frame rates were reporting correctly and consistent across the workflow, and no matter what, it always drifted just a tiny bit. It wasn't really noticeable until you recorded over 10 to 15 minutes, but it always kind of bugged me. Well, I never really figured out what the cause was, but I can say it's completely gone away since moving my workflow over to the Zoom F6, so it must have been something to do with the Steinberg. The Zoom F6 also has a more powerful headphone output. It's still not amazing, but it's noticeably better than the Steinberg and enough for me to be satisfied. But I don't really drive that stiff of headphones either, the worst I'm dealing with are about 80 ohms with medium sensitivity. Now switching from a unit that was intended more for music and combining guitar and vocals, I do notice a difference in the character of the sound on the F6. Stuff like this is always hard to describe, but I'd say the Zoom F6 is cleaner and tighter, but a bit more sterile. You could argue that the other interfaces are warmer and smoother and more bassy, but you could also argue that they're sloppier and that the vocals aren't as crisp. And since the F6 is used a lot in dialogue recording, having those clean pronounced vocals is a big advantage Advantage. And for music that's mixed with precise, almost isolated sounding instrumentation, the F6 actually sounds more lively and detailed. But if you like a smooth, blended sound profile, you might find this a tad harsh. Now, all of these characteristics are somewhat subtle though, and this is just based on my ears, but it has grown on me quite a bit for the music that I listen to, and the dialogue recordings are very sharp. Now, for location work, obviously my USB audio interface wasn't really a good solution, so I'd use a field recorder as well. But with the Zoom F6, it serves both purposes and is much more robust and featured compared to the smaller handheld recorders that I was previously using. There's three things that's lacking though when compared to something like the Steinberg UR22, and I have solutions for half of them. So, 1.5 solutions. First, it doesn't accept instrument level input. In fact, it doesn't even have a TRS input socket, just XLR. But even if you adapted your guitar, let's say, with an XLR cable, it's not able to deal with that signal because it has no high Z switch or capable port. So you'll need to route your guitar first through your amplifier or direct box. It does accept line level inputs from instruments though, like a keyboard, but again, you'll need to use an XLR connector. It also doesn't have an auxiliary in, which is usually in the form of a 3.5 millimeter jack, but because you can combine XLR inputs into stereo pairs, you can use a splitter cable that goes from 3.5 millimeters to two XLRs and then just link the two inputs together in the menu. The third limitation, which is the one that I dislike the most, is the lack of balanced outputs. The only line out on this, other than the headphone jack, is a 3.5 millimeter unbalanced stereo output, which is good for going to a camera as it operates at the consumer line level of minus 10 dB, but it's not great for studio monitors, which is what I usually have connected to my USB audio interface. And this is probably the biggest area where it falls short from my experiment to see if I could get the Zoom F6 to replace all of my devices. Now, I've managed to make it work reliably, but there is a bit more white noise than I'd usually get from the balanced output puts on my Steinberg. I'm using a breakout cable that goes from the 3.5 millimeter TRS plug to two mono female quarter inch sockets. Then I'm running my balanced quarter inch TRS cables to my monitors from those sockets. Now I wasn't expecting the balanced cables to make a difference at this stage because the line out is unbalanced, but they do offer a cleaner and quieter result. Perhaps it's just from better shielding, but they worked better than just using a standard unbalanced Y cable. 
Now the line out doesn't have its own volume knob, only the headphones do, so this next workaround is one that I'm a little bit proud of, but I'm also impressed by the F6 for letting me do this by having a very thorough menu. So first, my advice is not to use this in the audio interface mode because that'll remove two functions. First, the ability to record to the SD card as a backup, which also means no 32-bit float recording, and again, there'll be no way to control the volume of the line out. By the way, for those of you that don't know what the advantage of this recorder's 32-bit mode is, let me explain very briefly and probably poorly. So the F6 has two ADCs, two converters that are taking your mic signal and converting it to digital, and they're tuned to different intensities. Not unlike cameras with dual ISO that let you switch to a different amp to get a cleaner image. Well, the 32-bit float allows the Zoom F6 to record from both of those ADCs at the same time and mix them together in a seamless way so that you maximize your dynamic range, minimize noise, and because 32-bit float allows for values higher than 0 dB, you can record sounds above 0 dB that would normally clip on other recorders and then bring them back down to below 0 dB in post, undoing that clipping and preserving the recording as if it never exceeded 0 dB in the first place. This is a pretty handy feature to have for unpredictable situations where you don't have the ability to monitor the audio as closely as you'd like. So to maintain that feature while connected via USB, I recommend using the AIF with record feature which lets you do both simultaneously. The only limitation is that your sample rate can't exceed 48 kilohertz, where you could get 96 kilohertz when in the dedicated interface mode, but that's no big deal for dialogue recording anyway. But the big advantage is that when you're in AIF with record mode, you can set your inputs to USB and those can be controlled with the fader knobs. And just like we did with the auxiliary XLR adapter, we can set the two inputs to the left and the right USB channels and then link them and then control the volume of the incoming USB signal with the fader knobs. And because they're linked, you only need to adjust one knob, effectively making that a line out volume for a USB audio interface. And the way you stop this from being redundant with the headphone volume knob for when you're using headphones is that you can send pre-fader sound to your headphones by choosing different routing options for it in the output menu because when you're in AIF with record mode, there's new options for USB. So you can assign USB to go directly to the headphones without being affected by the fader, but then have the knob that we set up for the fader to go to the line out, allowing you to control separate levels coming through your monitors and your headphones at the same time without any overlap. Like I said, I'm proud of this configuration, but I'm also very pleased that you can do with the F6 because all it would have taken is the removal of some of the items from the menu and this wouldn't be possible. Customization is king and I love that all these options are included. Now just give me some balanced outputs like the TA3s on the F8 and I couldn't be happier. Now this method does tie up two of your XLR ports, but the Zoom F6 offers a better dollar per input ratio than the competition, so I don't mind having only four free jacks left as that's all I would really ever need. Now, I don't want to get too abstract and start describing the nuances and the preamps when recording my mic. All I can say is that you're hearing me right now through those preamps, and I think some of the previous comments that I made about it being tight and sterile, not as warm, but precise, still play. Zoom uses excellent preamps, and I'm very satisfied. The inputs are locking and feel very good. The unit has a metal exterior build and feels like solid construction. It's got three power options, AA batteries, Sony L-series batteries, and USB power. And it runs off of USB power while using it as an interface, so you don't need to supply a dedicated 5 volt separate of your data connection like some devices. Just a single cable will do. The main thing I think people will complain about with the build is the form factor and the cramped feeling. Now, I don't really mind personally. I'm not using this in a sound bag, and even though I have giant hands, I haven't actually found the buttons or dials difficult, but I can totally appreciate and understand the complaints I've heard from people who do find them to be a bit crowded or small, or those who wonder why it was built more cube style instead of your typical flatter rectangle. It doesn't bother me but it's something to consider. The Zoom F6 also offers time code, which is great, but there's something quirky about it that I wanna talk about because this might be something that can be addressed with firmware, but if not, I have a workaround for the time code problem when using this device with the Blackmagic Pocket 4K. So the Zoom F6 has full time code capabilities, both sending and receiving, and a dedicated port to do that. And it works well, it keeps good time, and I love that it's included. However, it sends its time code out of the right channel on a typical 3.5 millimeter TRS cable, and it receives it back on the left channel. Now the Pocket 4K only receives time code, but it does so also on the left channel. So if you connect it to the F6, it won't recognize the time code regardless of whether you use a TRS cable or a TS cable, because both are listening on the same channel and neither is sending. Now I was able to make this work by adding an adapter to the one end of my TRS cable, which converts from stereo to mono. This basically consolidates the signal coming from the F6, including the time code on the right channel, and combines it into a single channel, which is seen as left when using the mono adapter on the Pocket 4K. And that works to effectively sync the Pocket to the F6, but remember to put the adapter on the Blackmagic side because it doesn't work if you put it on the zoom side because of the same channel misalignment. 
Right now I'm actually using the time code from the F6, coming out stereo, if you will, out of the F6 and then mono into the Blackmagic and it's working fine. And I mentioned firmware because I think this could be a nice menu option to add to the F6, the ability to switch which is the send and which is the receive channel. That way when you're pairing it with a camera like the Blackmagic, you could just choose left instead of right to send the time code and then you'd receive it on the opposite one. So hopefully that's something that could be added to the menu in the future because it'd be handy to be able to customize your time code in and out depending on which camera it's connected with. One thing I wasn't expecting was the lack of stuff in the box. It's really only the unit itself and the camera bracket. There's no cables whatsoever. Now this isn't so much of a complaint, but more of a surprise that made the unboxing experience kind of underwhelming. It did come with AA batteries though, which isn't something you see too often these days. Overall, I really, really like the Zoom F6. I can definitely recommend it, and this model here is one that I purchased myself and I'm keeping. I love the versatility, the sound quality, and the customization. But I don't love the lack of balanced outputs or the reliance on adapters to make it do everything I want it to do. But that brings us back to my opening question. Do you think it's better to have one device that with an adapter here and a fun menu tweak there, you can make it do everything you need? Or would you rather run multiple dedicated devices without the need for tweaking, but requiring more gear and the drawbacks that come with that? And do you have an example of this in your life, even if it's not about audio or cameras, but where you've consolidated all your devices into one monstrosity that does it all? I'd love to hear about your experiences in the comments below. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video entertaining or helpful, well, then it might be time for you to get a firmware update. All right. I'm done.